Welcome to Inside Voices, a well-read magazine between the pages podcast. I'm Robert Galton here with my friend and co-host, the amazing and talented Jeff Jeffrey Dell Lofton, and we're both excited to enter in the conversation today with award-winning author Donna Everhart. Welcome, Donna. Hi. Nice of you to have me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. So, Jeffrey, before we get started, I'm going to have you introduce Donna to our listeners. Oh, it'd be a pleasure. So Donna Everhart is the USA Today bestselling author of authentic, vivid Southern fiction, including the Southeastern Library Association award-winning The Road to Bittersweet, Indie Next Pick and Amazon Book of the Month, The Education of Dixie Dupree, The Forgiving Kind, The Moonshiner's Daughter, The Saints of Swallow Hill, and her sixth novel, When the Jessamine Grows, releases January 23, 2024, and Donna was born and raised in Raleigh, North Carolina, one of my favorite towns. And she now lives with her husband in a small town in the Sand Hills region where she is currently working on her, her next novel. And she's a member of the North Carolina Writers Network uh, Historical Novel Society and is the host for the Mary Jane's Farm Book Club. It's so good to talk with you, Donna. I'm excited. I can't wait to get into the conversation with the both of you. You know how it is when authors are together. <laughs> we like to talk shop and whatever else. So we do I'm, like I'm to ready. talk. <laughs> Good. Well, so Donna, I'm really excited because as Jeffrey stated in your bio, when the Jessamine grows, it's going to make its way out of the world very soon, January 23rd, 2024. What can readers expect from this latest Donna Everhart novel? It's interesting. I like this question because I just spent um, probably two days trying to record in one minute why if readers read The Saints of Swallow Hill, they're going to want to read When the Jessamine Grows. And the main point First of all, it goes against my Southern roots to have to talk so fast. So that was just a challenge <laughs> to get everything there in a minute. But um, essentially in The Saints of Swallow Hill, I brought to readers an almost unknown bit of history. And that was of the turpentine camps that were prevalent throughout the American South. And it's also the origin story for why North Carolina became known as the Tar Heel State. A lot of people thought that had to do with the Civil War, and it didn't. So this was an unknown bit of history that I felt like I was bringing into the world that many people had not read about. And if they had, it was maybe a little blip on the radar in a book maybe that they were reading. When the Jessamine Grows is very similar in that even though I set that story during a very familiar time frame, that of the Civil War, I take a very different approach to it. For one, Joetta McBride and her husband are yeoman farmers living in Nash County, North Carolina. And because of their lifestyle, they think the war has nothing to do with them. So they take a neutral standpoint. And this, this is highly unusual. And it ends up, of course, very dangerous for them. But the other main point about this book that I think sets it apart from your typical Civil War novel is that I don't write about the war. Instead, I write about the families who are left behind, women like Joetta McBride, who are required and compelled to keep food on the table, keep the farms running, keep the family together. So this is really a story about what happens to the family members who are left behind. I love that. Yeah. And Donna, you mentioned, you said, you know, like, True, a true Southerner talking about your work, talking about so much is just not, you know, it's not something that we we do comfortably. But there's such a, a there's such a Southern tradition of being storytellers, and of course, you know, having written so many books, you're a storyteller. I have always wanted to know how you got started as a novelist. What about your storytelling background got you into this part of your life? You know, for me, I am, um, I'd say, the untraditional author. And the other thing I wanted to say about that is that when we start off as writers, every one of us is coming from a different place. 
every approach is different. So to give you an example, when I made the first probably statement that I wanted to be a writer, I was 18 years old. Some people I think are 18 months. I mean, they just have this innate knowledge that from the moment they're born, this is what they were meant to do. First and foremost, for me, I was a reader. And so this launch point for every single person is so different. And so for some people, they immediately, as soon as they can hold a pencil or a pen in their hand, they start writing. And they, you know, I've, I've heard of these stories of people who wrote when they were children and they put out their own books and their family read them. And, you know, lo and behold, they become one of these under 35 type of authors who get published or whatever, um, you know, so very successful from an early standpoint. Whereas somebody like me, who is a late bloomer, it seems like in all things, I made that declaration when I was 18 and then life happened. I was not published until I was in my late 50s. And um, so for every single person, you know, it's different. Some people, the time frame is, uh, you know, a decade. And for some people, it's se several decades. Um, my path was very meandering. I mean, I had a corporate job for 35 years. I'm an IT person. I was a cubicle rat for, mm -hmm. for decades, you know, and if my company had not gone bankrupt, I honestly believe I would still be there working towards my retirement with my dream of writing somewhere in the background, but oops, you know, wait, I've got to do this project first for the company, but they went bankrupt. And literally, that's kind of how it started for me. It's kind of weird to say. I mean, again, I've read voraciously my entire life, and there are writers that did influence me. Um, but the bottom line is the way I came to writing was being sort of shoved off the cliff. And I told my husband when I knew that my job was going to end, if it didn't end within three months, it, it was going to end, you know, in whatever time that would be. It ended up being three years because I stayed with the company as they did their chapter 11 process and shut the systems down and sold parts of the business off. But that afforded me time to go back and get my degree in business management. And in the meantime, I continued to work for them. And then I was working on this manuscript that I had started after reading one of my authors that I will tell you about, I guess, if you ask me that question, um, that influenced me. So, you know, it was not unexpected, but in a way it was. And so I feel very fortunate. Well, who are some of those authors who influenced you? Well, funny you should ask. <laughs> I happen to have the books here. Um, I wanted to show them because it's, I just feel like this is something I like to do. So when I knew what I wanted to write, I had landed on um, this um, book here. So I'm going to try to hold it up. Can you see it? Ellen yes. Foster by Kay Gibbons. I'm going to tell you right now, I mean, I... Honestly, you know, there are Southern writers out there. We know of William Faulkner, Carson McCullers, Flannery O'Connor, you know, all of these brilliant um, authors that came from a certain time frame in our lives. And if you're a Southern writer, you know, more than likely you read some of their work and their work was good, but their work didn't ignite in me that desire. This is what I want to write. But Kay Gibbons did. And another one, Dorothy Allison, mm. bastard out of Carolina. This is That's not funny. probably news to either one of you. Um, and so those those were literally the writers that that I felt were the strongest influence on my work in the early days. Another one was Robert Morgan um, and his book, Gap Creek. This mm -hmm. book heavily influenced my novel, The Road to Bittersweet. So, I mean, that gives you some idea of where I was at. I mean, I was reading Stephen King, you know, for like 30 years or so. But when I landed on these more contemporary authors of Southern fiction, and I mean, their stories are 
considered it like Robert Morgan Gap Creek would be historical fiction. Um, but I'm just saying that they were the ones that ignited that desire. This is what I want to write. So I, I'm, I'm drawn as most of your readers are to the extraordinary female characters who inhabit your novels, the young girls, young women with the odds stacked against them. When I think of a Donna Everhart protagonist, I think of resilience. And Joetta McBride certainly possesses resilience. She's a woman of conviction. In what ways do you see your protagonists connected from one book to the next? Well, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head because um, one thing that I have talked about, so, and this is... Um, something that whoever listens to this may have heard me say before in previous um, sessions like this, but that is, I love nothing better than to put my characters in peril and see what happens, <laughs> you know, start trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to have happen here? Um, and I think I like the idea. I mean, we all, experience challenge in our lives, male and female. We all have to struggle through something. And I like to create these characters that can resonate maybe with someone. I love getting emails from readers who say, oh, I could relate so much, you know, to what happened with, say, you know, Dixie Dupree. I actually received a lot of emails from women who had been in those circumstances, um, you know, or suffered through deprivation like Wallace Ann and her family in the road to bittersweet. I mean, just all of these sort of everyday or historic events, you know, that I write of from um, the female perspective and the challenges they faced in that time because of the time. Um, I just love exploring that and understanding for that time what it meant to them to be in that particular situation for themselves. It's kind of eye-opening for me. You know, within that world, um, within the worlds that you create, there's a darkness that permeates them. What draws you to the murk? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. It seems kind of perverse, really. <laughs> I, but I love, I I'm love about it. to hold up another book. And I'm going to, when I admit this, it might seem like, okay, she might need to see someone. But this is one of my favorite books of all uh, time. Carmen McCarthy, Child mm -hmm. of God. Yeah, I, um, and I think what it is, because, I mean, let's be real. This book is um, very twisted, very dark. And um, so why like it? And I think it's because Cormac McCarthy in the character of Lester Ballard takes this man who is suffering from rather um, not only dark, but depraved type of, you know, lifestyle. And yet he makes him at times, aside from creepy and sick, amusing. I mean, I, I kind of chuckled and which is kind of weird, you know, in some areas of this book. Um, so, you know, the parts of any book that are dark and I tend to lean into the darker stories. Um, Donald Ray Pollock is another author that I like. Um, another book is Betty by Tiffany McDaniel. I mean, these books all deal yes. with these you know, very upsetting and challenging, um, you know, themes. And I think it's like, um, you know, if we think about social media today, you can get sucked into some of the crazy clips, you know, like there's, there's, there's this one site that <laughs> captures me every time. And it's, it's, um, I won't say what the name is, but they're constantly showing all of these clips of these people in these very precarious and dangerous positions. And of course, the camera always shuts off and you're like, did they live? Did something really bad happen? I mean, 
I, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but I kind of get sucked into that sometimes. And I'm thinking I should be writing right now. <laughs> uh, uh, and there's 48 hours and all of these um, evil lives here. I don't watch all that stuff. It's like that proverbial car wreck that we can't look away from. And it's the right. same with reading. I am always, um, you know, on the edge of, I love to be on the edge of my seat when I'm reading a story. I try to do that with my own work to some degree. You know, Donna, social media, you know, it does, it can draw you in and take all your time. And, but it also, you know, it, it can connect you to other people as well. I mean, that's how I actually first met Robert and I found him online and I contacted him. I said, you don't know who I am. Have <laughs> you had the opportunity to meet any of these authors who've inspired you? Um, Have or- I met any of them? I talk to them? May I? Oh, gosh, wouldn't that? Well, so um, it's kind of interesting because, first of all, no, I I haven't. Um, but like, for instance, uh, Kay Gibbons, I mean, she's a she's a Raleigh writer. She grew up actually in Nash County where um, when the Jessamine Groves takes place. That's kind of interesting. Um and I was at a book club a couple of months ago, and one of the ladies that was the hostess of that book club knows Kay Gibbons. And I was, I mean, I was like, really? Oh my gosh, every time I do a book event, and that's how I, that's how she brought it up, or that's how I, you know, ended up um, knowing that she knew, Kay. she went to high school with her. Oh and I, I was talking about Kay Gibbons. Oh, yeah, the influence of my writing is Kay Gibbons. She goes, well, I went to high school with her. And I was like, oh, you know, I mean, so anyway, I, wouldn't I love to be able to meet her? Um, but no, I haven't. And, you know, I, I guess I'm sort of, um, what do I, how do I want to say this? Um, I'm not real, like, out not I, I don't want to use the word outgoing because I mean I'm the sort of person that I'm very happy at home I get an invitation to do something and I'm like oh gosh you know I'm gonna have to get dressed and wash my <laughs> hair <laughs> I'd rather stay here and you know read or whatever um but then I get out and I have a great time you know I'm always laugh I love it you know I love being around people so, so I guess what I'm saying is I'm not forward I would, I, I'm not going to, you know, I mean, somebody at that level, you know, like a Kay Gibbons or like a Donald Ray Pollock, or, I mean, I don't know. I just, I wouldn't have the nerve. <laughs> I just would love to hear from you though. We'll have to make that happen though, Jeffrey. We'll have to figure out a way that we can, we can bring Miss Gibbons into the, into the, into the mix. Oh gosh. I would, I would have a heart attack. <laughs> oh, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, the, your novels set in these different eras and, um, you know, talking about social media, having access to information online, even, um, you know, real um, access to library collections without even having to, having to go there. How do you conduct your research for the books? I mean, I, there's a, I think I recall there's a, like a depression era recipe for the Saints of Swallow Hill. And is that, is that the typical kind of thing that, that um, the typical approach you take to immerse yourself in another era? How do you do that? That's a great question. Um, so the water pie actually came off of us um, depression era site you know, as a recipe. And something else I learned too was that I believe it was Eleanor Roosevelt um, who would create these recipes because she wanted everybody to know that President Roosevelt was eating just like everyone else during the Depression. And they said she was a terrible cook. <laughs> Some of the stuff was just awful. Um, but, you know, her heart was in it. So my research is um, all over the place. I love nothing better than to find a thesis paper, which I have been fortunate to be able to do, like in the Saints of Swallow Hill. 
I relied heavily on a couple of thesis papers. Um, same thing happened with the work, my work in progress right now. I've landed on that. So I use, I try to um, utilize, I guess you could say scholarly materials as much as I can, but I also rely heavily on, like you said, library information. I'll reach out to a resource uh, librarian and ask them questions. Um, I rely on Google, obviously. Um, I rely on finding out like historic events because a lot of times that's how I landed on the Saints of Swallow Hill and the idea, I shouldn't say the landed on, but the concept for that book was through research and landing on the word naval stores. And I was like, what the heck is that? And the more I found out about it, the more I realized I had gold in my hands right there. Um, so it's really kind of a combination of all of these things, all of these tools. And the recipes are a big part of how I sink a reader into a time frame. Because even though a lot of the food can seem very similar, like there's always in the South going to be some biscuits being made and some cornbread. <laughs> um, but there are other things, too, that I use to help me envision this time period. And I love finding old photographs and I study them. Um, and of course, finding old photographs, like, for instance, for when the jessamine grows is very difficult because, of course, that was the 1860s. But they're out there. And I really studied um, I've done a lot of studying of old photographs. And so between the food, the photographs, and all of the other things that I might read online, all of this, I, I'll tell you one other thing um, that just came to me. I downloaded um, a document that talks about the plants, the types of trees that are in certain areas of our, like my, my state. So that I won't accidentally say that this, you know, tree or flower or whatever grows here when it doesn't, you know, or it's like the wrong time frame for it. Same thing throughout the the southeast. Um, it covers all of that. And it's probably one of these agricultural colleges. I can't remember. It could be Clemson. It could be some something from NC State, you know, which is an agricultural engineering college. So I utilize all of these things to create the atmosphere and give my characters and their setting authenticity. What would you say, Donna, surprised you most? What did you learn that maybe astonished you when you were researching when the jessamine grows? Oh, my gosh. Um, first of all, <laughs> you know, um, this is a delicate topic, obviously. Um, it's the Civil War. And I think I think the thing that I picked up on, and I'm sort of making an assumption here, but if you think about it in a broader context, it is that position of neutrality. So you had the border states. Well, that essentially meant that they didn't want to take a side, you know? This is actually how we got West Virginia, because the state as a whole was much bigger than, and they had certain um, areas of, of the entire, um, I don't know the word I'm looking for, it's a word I remember them using, but anyway, in this, whatever I was reading, again, you know, research. So, um, but that's how West Virginia came about. And the other thing, so I, this really kind of triggered my thought. And I was like, okay, I have to believe that if you had whole entire states, you know, so Virginia was one in West Virginia, Kentucky, um, and I can't recall now uh, if Maryland was one. But anyway, there was several of them, you know, there was like five total that didn't want to um have anything to do with the war they were waiting to see what was going to happen 
And so I began to think about it down. To, so that's like at the macro level. And I began to think of it down at the micro level, individual people, you know, like the McBrides. What did the war have to do with them? They are in Nash County, North Carolina. And I learned how very, very rural Nash County is. And not just Nash County, North Carolina as a whole. I mean, I think 85% of the state at that time was just so, I mean, I don't want to use the word backwards, but it was literally nothing but woods and farmland. And there was hardly any, there were cities and, you know, t little towns, but they were very far and few between. Um, and so they had never had slaves. And so it's sort of like, why, you know, why would they become involved? So there was that. And then I think the other thing that really hit me about when the Jessamine grows is the fact that um, the Civil War was a long time coming. It didn't just happen, you know, like over the course of a year or two. It went all the way back to the early 1800s and some of the... Um, laws and whatnot that was being passed by Congress. And so it was like sort of a culmination of all of these political things that were happening. Um, and there's a ton more, but I could go on and on. But it was it was really eye opening history for me. What so you you had said earlier on that this really isn't a novel about the Civil War, but it takes place than the context of the Civil War. Was there any apprehension, apprehension on your part in um, in writing a novel in this current environment that we're in um, that that is um, surrounded by and takes place within the Civil War? Yeah, I was, I, you know, I'm still kind of nervous about it. And I mean, the book is done. Um, it's, you know, being given out to early readers um, as we speak. I have book events that are going to come up and I'm thinking about um, the current state of things. But yet again, I'm, I'm sort of telling a story, I believe, from a perspective of I was raised in a what I call a purple household. Um, so my dad was a Democrat. He was from uh, North. This is going to be kind of interesting, maybe to some people. Um, from North Carolina. So, you know, I guess you could say a Southern Democrat. I don't know. He never spoke ill of anyone. He didn't drink. He didn't cuss. He didn't go to church <laughs> either. You know, he was just who he was. Very gentle, uh, kind, and unassuming individual. My mother is from Maine, and she was the Republican. So, you know, um, purple household. So I'm telling the story, you know, even though it's set during the Civil War, it goes back to like what I was talking about that makes this book different from other Civil War books. It's not about um, the enslaved people. It's not about somebody being an abolitionist. It's not about um, a Confederate viewpoint. And it's not about a Union viewpoint. It's literally I mean, I'm trying to walk the the middle line here as you could say, like as an independent, you might agree with some aspects of this side and you might agree with some aspects of that side. Um, so I'm I'm in that in between air area with the story. And the main thing that was so critical and so important to me was to write the story in such a way that I did not convey anything of my own viewpoints. I'm not ever, if I can help it, I'm not going to preach to anybody. Everybody's got their own thoughts. They can, you know, think how they want to think. They can express themselves how they want to. And so that was really important to me. And I hope that shows in this story. This is literally, truly just a story about a woman who is left behind struggling to keep her farm going. And she becomes a pariah in her community because she refuses to take a side. It's It was very dangerous for her to do that. You know, the concept of a, pers a purple household, a purple point of view is relatively new, I think. I mean, it doesn't mean that it didn't exist, but the 
the label purple mm -hmm. uh, didn't uh, I haven't done the research <laughs> you have maybe maybe some maybe there's a similar concept for, for from that era did you find anything in your research about people who tried to I mean I know that, that you spoke of the, the the macro level being sort of neutral um, and you, you applied that to the personal relationships did you find examples of that in any literature any of your research that there were people who like in their personal lives tried to remain neutral you know um to answer the question quickly no but i think i know why because if anybody had actually lived that sort of um or tried to um put themselves into the same situation as joetta mcbride they probably would have been killed or put into prison um, and, and here's, I think people didn't talk about it. I read stories. There was one, um, so there's, I'm trying to do this without giving away any spoilers, but there is a, you know, <laughs> um, there is a part of the story where Joetta is having to hide. She and other parts of her family, they are forced to hide. And that actually happened to an individual. Um, and so I purposefully tried to research anybody that would have had a neutral standpoint. I mean, you it, it could be like the book that I'm working on right now where I had to uh, land on a key word to really sort of explode the background behind this work in progress that I have right now um, because I couldn't find a thing on what I was trying to find. And um, I think it could be very similar. And I, maybe I just didn't get the right choice of words in my search, but it it's not very well known if it is out there. And I think it's simply because people didn't talk about it and they didn't talk about it because of the danger behind it. Of course. Yes, I could see that. I mean, if you're looking at any controversial period of time or any period of war, you know, within a geography, it would certainly be unsafe to 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 not at least take a side or the or the predominant side of of the the catchment that you're living in, I would imagine. And I think that's what's really fascinating about the the stance that you're taking with this new book. Uh, when we hear stories of the Civil War, we're always hearing about a side mm -hmm. um, or sides. And so the, I think that this is fascinating and I'm really looking forward to ha having the opportunity to dig in and, and to read a lot more about Joetta McBride and her family. I, I hope th you'll this, enjoy it when you I do. know that I will. So, you know, <laughs> I'm a huge Donna Everhart fan and uh, I have not read the latest book yet, but I'm looking forward to it. But I will say I am getting some sneak peeks into your work in progress, which is certainly a pleasure um, it gives me some insight in, into your process. Um, you know, and so um, within that lane, you know, this, this latest novel is your sixth novel. How would you say that you've changed as a writer since the release of your debut, The Education of Dixie Dupre? You know, this is another question that I really like because um, Dixie Dupree. So the education of Dixie Dupree, that's that's the book. And I don't know if any other author is like this. So you both have your books out. Um, but when I was writing Dixie Dupree, I, I felt like it was this sort of like um, all or nothing. And by that, I meant I'm going to write this book and it's going to have all kinds of stuff in it and it's going to be this and it's going to be that and she's going to be this way and, and literally it is like that <laughs> um sort of the kitchen sink of dysfunction and so um so now you know uh, and of course when I wrote the road to bittersweet that's I did what I call panic writing because that is like you've got this first book now and uh, you know so with Dixie Dupree, what happened with that is, so I'm working for my company. I lose my job in March of 2012, but I had signed on with my agent in March of 2012, but it took three years 
for Dixie Dupree to sell. And that's why I say I was panic writing because number one, can I do this again? And number two, if I can do it again, you know, um, that's going to be good because hopefully they'll want another book. So, um, so I would say that, you know, with Dixie, I was just writing everything that my heart desired that I would ever want to put in a book. And if it sold great, and if nothing else ever sold, I had done it with that. You know? And then with the other ones, I began to really sort of um, settle in, if that makes sense, and get that um, less panicked approach to my writing and um and so I would say that probably the biggest difference has been I always want to have my stories have that Southern feel to them. But I'm leaning, it seems like lately, more into historic fiction and really trying to utilize events of the past to tell my stories. And that you know, you can't say that Dixie Dupree isn't historic fiction, but that's truly because of the timing of the book, which takes place in 1969. And I've always read anything that's older than 50 years old is basically considered historic fiction. Um, but with The Road to Bittersweet, my inciting incident is a historic event that actually took place in North Carolina. And that was a flood in 1940 in Jackson County, where it takes takes place. And um, in the forgiving kind, it's, um, uh, you know, that's about cotton farming or Sonny Creech is on a cotton farm, but it's, it's 1955 and it's Sonny Creech dealing with the bigotry and the race, uh, some of the racism, that's a little bit of a lighter part of it, but mostly about the bigotry of that time. And her best friend, Daniel, is different. And, and and that was, you know, for that time, very, very dangerous um, and against the law, which I find just mind blowing. And then um, the Moonshiner's Daughter, you know, I wanted to write a story that dealt with moonshine because North Carolina's got the moonshine capital of the world in Wilkes County. But that's historic. You know, again, I just so my biggest I'd say my biggest change is. Um, those first four books were coming of age, written in first person. And then I sort of broke away from that, leaned in heavier to the historic side, started writing third person uh, point of view and um, stepped away from coming of age. So those are kind of the biggest shifts for me. And I hope I'm getting better <laughs> as I go along. You know, you're supposed to improve. Well, you absolutely are. And I think that you, what you're doing, you're doing a thing that writers need to continuously do, and that's to push themselves and to take chances. And yeah. um, I can already tell um, some of your advanced readers for When the Jessamine Grows, um, it, they're, they're saying wonderful things about the book. So I know that you must be excited. Uh, we are coming to the end of our time together this evening. I hate it. I hate I don't it too. Hang up. <laughs> so, it, well, you know what? And when we're, when we're done recording, we can hang out for a little while. <laughs> Jeffrey, I'm going to toss it over to you and, and let you conclude with our final question for this evening. Well, Donna, we're interested to know what's next. Well, we've been kind of hinting around to it. <laughs> and like, uh, I mean, I, I was talking about this work in progress thing. And Robert has been kind enough to step in and, and be a beta reader for me. And I, I actually need to send him some of my latest stuff. So, um I'm really excited about this book. I hope uh, I can get to the end of it without pulling all my hair out. Um, I have had, um, I want to say, some hesitancy to talk too much about it, but I will say this about it. It is based on, yet again, historic events. But I think when people realize, and I'm trying to decide the structure of the book as far as like my author's note. Do I want to put my author's note at the very beginning instead of putting it at the end like I typically do? Because I want people to realize when you start to read this book, you're going to need to understand this actually happened. And I feel like 
it's going to make women potentially want to burn their bras again. <laughs> it is a historic event that impacted women heavily. Um, it is mind blowing what was taking place in our country at this time. It is mind blowing why it was happening and the reason behind it. And if that isn't enticing enough, I, I just, I'm, I'm not really wanting to say too much about it because I'm so early into it and I don't even know exactly. I'm under contract for the book, so we know it is going to be published, but um, the book is not due until August of next year. So it will be at least, you know, a year and a half from now to two years before we get to see it. So Robert can fill you in offline, Jeffrey, <laughs> offline, on right. and it's, more details. <laughs> and it's going to be awesome. And I don't wear a bra and I want to burn one. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be there to watch. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll, we'll do it via Zoom. So, that that would be great. That would be great. Donna, thank you so much for taking the time to kick off our 2024 year um, with Inside Voices with you. That, that, that means a great deal to us. We wish you every success with When the Jessamine Grows. Well, I certainly appreciate the effort and the time you both have put into having me. I want to extend my thanks to anybody and everybody else behind the scenes who may also be involved. This was very, very exciting for me, and I appreciate every minute that you've spent with me tonight. Thank you. So gentle listeners, until next time, I'm Robert Gwaltney for Inside Voices. And I'm Jeffrey Dale Lofton. And remember, to be creative is to be courageous. Thanks so much. <laughs>